After a grueling four months in the boatyard, we finally went back into the water, minus a fully functioning engine. The dock that we planned to stay at sent over some nice fellows with a 15 horsepower outboard and a dinghy to come pick us up. They came at night and they towed us to where the boat is now. Robbie's away once again, so I thought that this might actually be a good time, since the two boys are not inside the boat roughhousing, to finish some much needed projects such as making mosquito net covers for the hatches, and to give you all a tour of the current state of our boat, a boat that we initially paid no money for, keep in mind. There are so many different ways to approach doing a boat tour, so I think I wanted to make this go hand in hand with the budget, like how we were kind of trying to manage our budget in the boatyard and then what the end result was. We haven't arrived at the end result inside, in our interior of our boat. So welcome in through the companionway of our 40-foot Venikins Corral. She's technically 39.5 but we just go 40, say 40, for, for ease of, of number. The first thing that you will probably notice as you enter this boat, which was built in the early 1980s, is that something really funky is going on with the paint and the varnish. If you've watched our videos in the last couple of years, you'll know that I've attempted to paint the pilot house interior several times. I went too cheap with the one part paint the first time I sanded it off, and then I used the last of our two part paint in the boatyard instead. The floor has become progressively less varnished. There goes the varnish on the boat. That's okay, I'm not a big fan of varnish. Worse than that is the fact that the cabin sole is unstable. When we opened up the floor to remove the leaky water tanks, in order to build the new water tanks, it never really returned back to its old stable self. Oui. That is on the list of upcoming tasks, to completely replace the floorboards. The other thing that you might notice is the leaky looking windows, which I also already tried to deal with before. But after resealing their edges, it ends up that the rubber gaskets on the inner frame are also leaking slowly. Another project to try yet again. I think I'm going to end up putting the sink there and the stove here. Oh my. Oh yes. <laughs> As we cleared out the interior, we slowly began to remove all the cabinetry, the literal rat's nest explosion of electrical wires, and all the hydraulic steering pipes. We do rest easier now knowing that we created an immense amount of space, and that that space is clear. Our electrical setup is extremely simple right now. We have our, our negative and our positive coming in from our solar panels. This is feeding in to the charge controller and the switchboard. Then coming out of the electrical box are lights in the boat. So we've got one, two, three, four right, up, right now running along this green tube running all the way along the starboard side of the vessel. So all the wires are contained within this tube. <laughs> right now we use flashlights on this boat and we just have a couple of USBs running out of it right now. I charge our lights daily. That's about all our battery can handle because our battery is really screwed up and we only have one battery. This gives us enough juice only to charge a couple of LEDs throughout the day. And how did we mess up our battery? Well, we tried running this Dometic 12 volt fridge on it and it couldn't handle it. Moral of the story is, don't have one 12 volt battery. It will not handle your old Dometic. Our solar panels could, in theory, provide enough power to run chart plotter, our laptop, our phones. We have the wire here feeding down to our battery. In theory, if we had more battery, we could use our mini inverter here. Despite our patrons and supporters sending us all the materials to create this wonderful electrical system, we have struggled to gather the one last component, the batteries to complete it all. The one battery can barely handle a couple of hours of this one light being on in the evening before the display drops down quickly below 10 volts or further, killing what remains of our battery. On the port side we have our copper 
which was really cheap at Home Depot here in Mexico, which just carries propane and then we can inspect it, we can see it. And what I love most about the pilot house is the ridiculous amount of space and potential to do anything in here. Look at all this floor all space! So much, your aerobics in here! So many activities! Do step class! On the port hand side, we temporarily have a nice big place to lie down, with a cushion that can either be used under the cockpit in the berth there, or out here. If you remember last year, I built one water tank. We hope to have two of them, and it meets our needs very well. We fill it up, and it last a couple of weeks. We can simply inspect the water level visually. There's always some condensation there, but I can always see what the water level is. That plastic through hull broke. I don't know, somebody's foot hit it and it just broke off. So that's an air vent right now. This has been a good area. Also keep gallon jugs of water here in Mexico. You do have to buy drinking water. You can't really drink the tap water. You'll get kidney stones. For sure. You'll remember before we came here to haul our boat out, I would actually have to go get water manually or sometimes Robbie would get it on a motorbike, but we would have to go around in the neighborhood and go find water when we didn't have water at the dock and we were just tied up to the mangroves. There's a gigantic amount of space in here. One of the very interesting features about this boat is the gigantic pilot house, of course, and the pilot house floor is very high up as you can see in here. We gained a lot of potential space when we removed the two leaky water tanks. The room that is available under on the underside of our pilot house floor is just is just ludicrous. So there's the fuel tank and it's raised a foot off of the fuel tank. These nice pieces, we could recycle these, use these nice thick pieces of wood to bring them down onto the fuel tank. And the fuel tank would be the level, the new level of the floor. I made this box out of some scrap wood and epoxy. The battery bank consisting of one whole battery. Not even a whole battery, it's like half a battery left. That's the lower part. Now up to the ceiling where we have a lot of potential storage as well. Where Ravi is testing out his system of hanging his many fishing rods. Finally, on the starboard side, we have a cabin below the cockpit, which is Choco's room for now, and a storage space for everything that we do not want living in the exterior cockpit locker. Coming into the galley here, you watch your step, it's a foot down, nice little garbage bin set up here, that's like the one thing I actually liked and kept. Our galley, although it looks simple, has come a long way. Other than where we sleep, this is the space where I think we spend the most time in our boat. We removed all the rotten wood, including the rotten floorboards. This very dangerous looking wall is Robbie's wall of knives. He has actually lost a couple overboard, so we're actually missing a lot of knives. Very important for me. Tea kettle. There were shelves here that was shit in the way. There was a microwave. There were boxes hiding the thing that pulls the chain plate to the hull. All we did was we removed all the stuff, ground down the nasty bits and paint it over with two-part epoxy paint. There have been a couple of projects that took a couple of tries. That includes this sink area, just the little ledge. Put actual cloth on the ledges here, not just epoxy filler. Other than that little ledge edge problem, this has actually been a really great setup for a sink. The business side and the relaxation side for our cutlery and dishes and pots and pans. Everything very manual. As you can see, this pulls up and gives us drinking water. And I don't, is it manual if it's foot pump? You don't have to use any power. I push down on the foot pump. I mean, I can get pretty aggressive here if I want. All sent to us by our patrons. Something I'm really happy about, something I'm really proud of is our cutlery setup, the pockets. And I made our stove top slash food box by hand. Just epoxy and fiberglass and paint. And it gimbled well on the way here. The original marine stove was 
toast, and the alternative cheap one that we bought was not meant to gimbal. We placed some metal weights on the bottom to help it gimbal. The biggest drawback right now is that the pots and pans can fall off, obviously. We need the help of the metal shop to make a better grill and pot holders. This is our safety mechanism for our propane stove. Open to cook, close when you're done cooking. We also have a second one of these valves outside in the cockpit. And of course, we have the ability to close the valve on the stove itself. So in a way that's three valves, well actually fourth valve is on the propane tank. So there's four mechanisms that can be closing our propane tank, stopping the gas. Very important to be able to inspect chain plates and anything coming in through the hull really. Really important to be able to, to inspect that. Everything that can be well sealed hides under the counter there. And I can reach to the back. It's a little bit awkward. You can't really put anything big in there. That's why we have our plastic bins out because this is not the best storage space for bigger things. I do admit we do have an ant problem and we even had a mouse problem in the boat yard. We have our fair share of creepy crawlies that come in and try to eat our food. So everything's either in a glass or plastic or strong container so that it, it's not invaded. Again, the cabin sole is just a monstrosity, but that will be a project for a different time. Since we've launched the bilge, this is the lowest point in the boat. The bilge has been bone dry. We've half installed the automatic switch here for the bilge pump, but we haven't installed, we haven't actually put the bilge pump in the bilge because we have no electronics to speak of at the moment. Opposite to the galley, as you come in down the little step, you have, here's the head. In the head here, we have some good little cupboards. Again, we kept those, but we took out the sink. We found out that it was leaking at the base of the sink and making our through holes rot. You can see it under the sink here. And our little bag of bungs. We got everything stuffed in here. We got our toilet toiletries. There's two separate doors for shutting the head because the area actually takes up quite a bit of space in the boat. So they made the boat with this kind of layout so that I think it's a lot less cave-like. When you have both doors open, when you have all the doors open, you can see all the way the cockpit. Now heading into the V-berth. Fair amount of cupboard space. I fight hard to keep this little nook here clean. Somebody's always putting shit on that table. Everything sanded down, ready to paint. And as far as V-berths go, this is a large and luxurious one. This is where most of the storage space on the boat is situated. Unfortunately, this just gives us tons of space to stuff our clothes into. You can see here where our electrical wiring backbone comes through the wall at the top. Okay, so one of our viewers actually recently sent us some beautiful, solid memory foam pillows, two of them, one for Robbie and one for me, and because we didn't receive them at our usual address, we had somebody else open up the package and lose the little slip that tells us who sent it to us. They sent it to an old address, we're, we're not there anymore. And so I can't figure out which one of our patrons or supporters sent us these pillows, but thank you very much. It's life-changing to have working, functioning, soft, squishy pillows. Under the laundry bag here, our depth sounder, which will run to our chart plotter when, when we need it. I've tried as much as possible to fill in these holes. I guess there was a diesel heater. We never saw that, but there must have been a diesel heater on the boat. And this was like the piping that piped the hot air throughout the boat. I cleaned a long time ago most of the wood and cleaned most of the ceiling, prepped it for paint. 
two-part epoxy paint, which is what I'm planning on doing next. So happy I made this mosquito netting. It's made life a lot breezier. Okay, now for the costs. Not including food. These are all the things I could keep track of that only have to do with living aboard. And we lived aboard throughout the entire process. Some of these items you'll notice that I separated into the things we paid for, and then other items are all the things that were di directly sent to us through our wish list by our patrons and our supporters. I just wanted to emphasize how thankful we are to our supporters because this kind of shows that literally we couldn't have done it without them. The running and the standing rigging are kind of a special case because we're friends with the rigging shop and we know that somebody else going to rig their 40 foot vessel might not get as good of a price that we do. As well as the engine is not currently propelling the boat in any way still, so I'm gonna do a separate kind of video and category for that. As well as the ground tackle, it's been an issue ever since we tried to help save the boat that was on the beach. It got bent and we're currently borrowing an anchor and a chain. So that will have a, a, a video for itself probably too and it's in a separate little category. What is the point of me going through the cost of the boat here? Well, I think a lot of people find it useful. A lot of people want to see the data, the numbers, the math behind what it takes to live on a boat. And even after all these years of living on a boat, traveling on a sailboat, I feel scarred but not scarred by difficulties, the injuries, the weather, nothing scary like that on our adventures. I feel scarred still by when I used to pay rent <laughs> when I lived on land. You know that saying, owning a boat is like throwing money into a hole in the water? Well, whoever came up with that saying, I think, never rented a basement apartment. Anyways, looking at these costs kind of makes me feel good about the space that Robbie and I have been working on, that we've been working so hard to build. In the end, like $700 a month to be working on our boat and to be creating something that in the future we can really be happy about, compared to the $1,400 a month average that you'll pay for an apartment and then you're not putting your money into something that is your own. It may not be a fancy boat, but we have something pretty darn cool.